The Bible reading today is taken from Joshua, uh, chapter 5, and we'll be reading verse 1 through to 12. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over, their hearts sank and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. At that time the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Haraloth. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the desert 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. The Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. On the evening of the fourteenth day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate of the produce of Canaan. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, please will you keep your Bible, Bibles open to that passage uh, which uh, Sharon read for us. We are now well uh, into the Sermon and Bible Study series in this Old Testament book of Joshua. Uh, if you have been following, uh, I hope that you are encouraged as I am uh, by the Word of God that we have the privilege of having in our hands and the privilege of having it in a language that we can understand. Uh, if you are joining us today, perhaps for the first time, uh, maybe you are a visitor. I see some visitors here. I recognize Linda Watt from the UK visiting us. It's lovely to see your face. And also we have some visitors who came especially uh, to pray with us uh, in between the services for our brother Leon, uh, who is uh, poorly. So it's great to have you with us. Uh, uh, as the preacher speaks today, uh, will you hear the voice of the living God? speak to you uh, by spirit. So as I begin, may I start with a question. How much time do you, th do you spend thinking about heaven? Of course, we, we can be so heavenly minded, but of no earthly use. But as a great writer of old wrote in, uh, um, uh, C.S. Lewis wrote in a wonderful book, Mere Christianity, as he wrote, he says, if you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did the most for the present world are just the ones that thought the most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this world. So how much time do you spend thinking about the day that finally fulfills all of God's promises and we are personally with the Lord Jesus Christ in His new creation? What difference does God's promise of heaven make to your life today? As you read Joshua, you would or should see that this book is included in the Bible to inspire eternal confidence in the people of God. 
Time and again we read and see that God is faithful. He never breaks a promise. He never fails. So when He promises to, to take all who believe in Jesus, when He promises to take all who believe in Jesus into His new creation, Christians don't just have to hope. We don't just have to believe. But we can know with certainty, with absolute certainty, that He will keep His word, that He will take us to the finish line. Of course, that doesn't mean that we, for example, treat death lightly. No, death is still real. But we can still be confident that our place in God's new creation is secure. Can I say that again? Our place, your place as a believer in God's new creation is secure. So what difference does that hope make to your life today? Read chapter 5 slowly and carefully and see that this chapter introduces us to two generations of God's people. An older generation who rejected the promises of God and disobeyed Him. And a younger generation, a newer generation that was committed to serve God, to listen to Him and to obey Him. And as we read, hopefully we will learn from the one and we will emulate the other. Consider with me first the younger generation and learn, and learn that God is indeed faithful to all of His promises. Just a bit of context of where chapter 5 fit in. The first unit of the book, the first four chapters, uh, uh, is about the people of God crossing over uh, to the promised land that God gave to them. The next unit from chapter 5 to verse 12 is about God's people taking the land of Canaan by force and driving out their enemies. So when you read chapter 5 verse 1, it seems that as all systems go. Verse 1, now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaan kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over, their hearts melted and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. It's all systems go for God's people. Because the enemies of God there, the text says, their hearts melted. The similar reaction we get, we hear from the account of Rahab in chapter 2. The Canaanite people in the land, as well as the leaders, they are not defiant. They don't seem eager for battle. They melted in fear because as enemies of God, they stood defeated already. See, the enemies of God saw the greatness of God. In other words, for the people of God, the land is there for the, taken, for the taking at the start of chapter 5. So one of the surprises when we get to this chapter uh, and as I was alerted to by one preacher, is that we expect military language at this point. Because remember, these guys are not going, they're going to take the land by force. So expect military language, military tactics, deployments, where are the soldiers, where are you sending your troops to, advancing armies and conquest as Jericho falls. That's what you expect. But actually, we are stopped in our tracks when instead of reading a military chapter, we read of three events which are profoundly spiritual by nature. Circumcision of the sons of Israel, the celebration of the Passover, the eating of the fruit of the land that God had promised them. As someone said, we are going to see that God wants His people to be spiritual before they are military. Can I say that again? We are going to see that God wants His people to be spiritual before they are military. That He wants them to begin in the land as He wants them to go on confident of His faithfulness and diligence to serve Him. He wants godliness more than He wants activism. Each of these three episodes underlines for us the faithfulness of God. 
Let's start with the circumcision story, verse 2. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Kibiath Haraloth. Looks like a physical impossi impossibility. It's like, uh, makes your eyes water. It's like a inner kind of response. You know, and yet a circumcision, I remind you, is the sign of God's relationship with his people. Ever since Abraham, all Hebrew boys were to be circumcised on the eighth day as a permanent sign that these people belong to the Lord God Almighty. In fact, circumcision was so important that if a man was not circumcised, he was excluded, he was cut off, pardon the pun, he was cut off from the people of God. So this new generation, that never been circumcised. Of, of course, they should have been circumcised at birth as a sign to everyone that they belong to God. But their parents had very little concern for God's agenda for their children. Here in verse 4, we see the reason why Joshua circumcised them. Now this is why he did so. All those came out of Egypt. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the desert 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised their fathers to give us a land flowing with milk and honey. So that's the reason why, why he had circumcised. So he raised up their sons in their place and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. Verse 7. So this circumcision, this act of circumcision was like a fresh start for the, of the people of God. The spiritually dead wood of the old generation had all gone. We see in verse 6, they all died. Why? Because they did not obey the word of God. But here now is a new generation freely submitting themselves to this right. One could say they were coming back to God, returning to the special covenant relationship with God that their fathers had actually rejected. They were saying, we don't want to be like them. We want to serve. We are committed to serve our living God. But even more important, dear friends, we are learning about God himself. Because you see, he, he remains the hero. An entire generation had given up on him. But he had not given up. On his promises because he is faithful he is he never breaks his promises and his purposes will never ever fail here is God marking out this new generation saying they are mine and he's getting them ready to occupy the land that he promised them it's rather rather a strange way to prepare for battle to incapacitate an entire army by circumcising them that is a tactic that you won't find in military books, I'm sure. But you see, God wanted the world to know that he had not given up on his people forever. For 40 years, Israel had been little more than object of scorn of the people of Egypt uh, who mocked them during those wandering years. Mockings like, what a beautiful wilderness your God has given you. He doesn't look so powerful now, does he? We treated you better as slaves as he treated you as sons. A real mocking. And actually, there had been some truth in the slander. As verse 6 shows, God had sworn, vowed by himself, that they would never see the promised land. And that, as one commentator puts it, sets the rebellion of the wilderness generation and put God's blessing on a pause, on a wait. But it had not stopped as God marks out his new, this new generation as belonging to him. 
He's given an indication to the world that this is a time for the blessings to flow again. Because God will be forever faithful to every promise that He makes to His people. The second big event is the celebration of the Passover. Verse 10. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. Israel had kept uh, uh, the Passover in the, in the wilderness. But this one year has additional significance in particular. See, our writer deliberately picks up and echoes language from the first Passover in, in, in the Exodus to let us know that what God started in, in Egypt as he delivered his people from Pharaoh and from slavery, here and now he's completing. It's like brackets of God's redemption for his people. What he starts, he finishes. Even though there are still battles to come uh, in the land, redemption is in a real sense completed and accomplished because here they are in the land commemorating God's rescue of them. And once again, the lesson is clear. Despite their sin, despite their wanderings of 40 years, despite their disobedience and rebellion, despite their grumbling, their suspicion, this God keeps His faithful promises. And this generation, this new generation, wanted to mark their arrival in, exact, in, in the land exactly the same way that God had told them in Exodus chapter 13 by celebrating the Passover. They saying, God kept his side of the bargain and we want to keep our side of the bargain. He is faithful and we want to serve him. Third event. Verse 11, the day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate of the produce of a wonderful story, a wonderful change of scenery uh, in, the, in this uh, um, narrative. Again, ever since God had rescued them from Egypt, He made sure that His people were provided for. He made sure that they had enough food and that they, um, that they needed by providing them miraculously manna from heaven. And I mean, just read that account. It was miraculous. Food, manna, just fell out of the sky. It was miraculous. The reason, though, that there is no more manna is that now that God is giving His people the fruit of the land, he no longer needs to give them bread from heaven. Although, mind you, that's not the focus. The point is that God had said that He will give them the, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now as they eat the produce, they are, as, as someone said, it's a mark of their ownership of that land. Finally, it was theirs. Finally, they were in the land that God had promised them so many years, years before. I wondered, you know, I wonder if you can imagine that first dinner proper. You know, all the kids and the parents are sitting around the dinner table. And, uh, uh, Mommy, what's this? Mommy, what's this? What's this? Oh, my boy, that's a potato. That's butternut. That's broccoli. Lacquer. These are nuts and grain. Remember, many of them would not have eaten anything but this manna from heaven. The girl would have asked, what's going on here? She said, my girl, we have arrived. We are here. Finally, our faithful God has done what he has promised. He has, in fact, given us the land. So three episodes then, and none of them is what, what, is what we would have been expected to, uh, to read but all of them making this key point of Joshua. God is faithful to all his promises. When he says he will do something, he will do it. And as always, as a preacher that I listen to on this text, 
says it is, the, it is the context of the chapter that gives particular force to the truth that directs our application. The context of the chapter gives us a way to apply this passage. See how the text puts emphasis on the solidarity of the older generation. Verse 4 to verse 6. Now this is why, this, this is why it did so. All those who came out of Egypt... All the men of military age died in the desert on the way after leaving. All the people that came out had been circumcised. So the point is, even when an entire generation of people oppose him, the work of God will indeed continue. Nothing can thwart it. A generation might fall, but God's purposes will never fail. It's such an important lesson for God's people, for us. The church in 2022 can easily take on a defeatist attitude to the work of God with no real confidence that He is actually still on the throne. He is still ruling the world. We're soft and we're timid in our work of evangelism and outreach. Unbelieving when we pray, if we bother to pray at all, it can all seem so hopeless. But here, God, by His Spirit, through the Scriptures, teaches us that no amount of failure and no amount of compromise in one locality or in one generation can stop the Word of God in its tracks. Do you believe that, dear Christian? Do you believe that? That nothing will stop the work of God. So when we say we exist to know Christ and to make Him known for the glory of God, we say it with conviction and with confidence because we know that God would want to use us to grow His kingdom. Because that's His desire for no one to perish but everyone to be saved. So as many people reject God's offer of mercy in our generation, it is no surprise that our faithful God is bringing to Himself millions and millions of people day by day, especially in the East, especially in Asia. So please, will we, will we continue to pray for the servants there who serve under terrible conditions, persecutors almost every day for the sake of making Christ known for the glory of God? See, as the church refuses to obey the voice of the Lord and in many places are, are dying a slow death, it is no surprise that we see this God still raising up hundreds of churches in their places because He's a faithful God and no amount of failure will stop Him. He will populate His heaven. Now, if God is so faithful as He is, what difference does that make to your life today? You see, God's faithfulness liberated Joshua to lead God's people to march onto Jericho and to take the land. His faithfulness did that. Liberated this whole generation to set themselves to serve the Lord their God in the land. Throughout history, many have been inspired to mighty works of service in the light of of their certain and sure place with the Lord Jesus in His new creation. So the question remains, what about us? What about you? To those new to the Christian faith, how will God's faithfulness inspire you, motivate you, persuade you to serve Him and His church? To those who have been around the block a little longer, is God's faithfulness making you an activist, running around doing all kinds of stuff in His name, doing it right and proper with perfectly crossed theological T's and perfectly dotted theological I's? Or, or is it making you strive after true godliness? See, those are questions that we actually have to engage with because the text does it for us. Joshua 5 will force us to ask these questions and to remind us, encourage us that God is faithful 
despite our struggles. But it also wants to warn us. And that's the second point. A warning from the older generation. If you think that you're standing firm, watch out. Take heed lest you fall. What's your attitude to, to those who have gone before? Your elders. What's your attitude to your elders? Listen to this quote that I picked up by Mark Twain. He writes, When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in only seven years. <laughs> That's adolescence for you. That's the arrogance of youth for you. The Bible often encourages us to learn and to listen to our elders. Not here in Joshua 5, though. We are not to emulate this wilderness generation. Because as a group, they were held up as the ultimate example of compromise and of failure. And Christians in every generation are encouraged to learn from and be warned by their mistakes. So here's the hard part of this sermon today. It's a message for every one of us who call ourselves Christians, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a great and a gracious warning, as hard as it is. It is a great and a gracious warning. See, in contemplating God's faithfulness and learning from their mistakes, God might just cause us to stand firm and, and not be tempted to fall and to fail. To be honest, this example of this older, older generation is very negative, but it's in the Bible. They perished, verse 6, because they did not obey the voice of God. Their crime was not intellectual or theological, mind you. It was moral. They were not ignorant of the word of God. They had been well taught as a generation. They were not confused about what God may be saying. Rather simply, they refused to obey. Simply put, they refused to obey. And the more you think about it, without being pharisaical, the more you get so annoyed at their rebellion and their disobedience. I mean, think of the many privileges that they had. Circumcised at birth, every man was reminded several times a day that his life belonged not to himself but to the Lord, and he understood that. They had witnessed the nine plagues in Egypt. They have seen it all. They knew the power of God on another level firsthand. Personally, they had celebrated that first Passover. These were the ones who had to wash their hands after dabbing their doorposts with blood in the Passover. They were the very ones sitting nervously at home, listening to the wailing of the Egyptians as the angel of death went through the land, killing every firstborn. They were the very ones who had gone up to the children's rooms and wept with joy when the eldest was still alive. They watched God part the Red Sea. They trembled at Mount Sinai as the mountain shook before their eyes. They themselves listened to Moses speak and delivering the law of God to them. They heard it with their own eyes, audibly. They followed pillars of fire and smoke in the wilderness day and night. But for all their privileges, their spiritual obituary was summarized by just nine words. They did not obey the voice of the Lord. Listen to a quote from Dale Ralph Davis, the commentator that we are engaging with as we study this great book. He writes, Hear the warning. They had been circumcised, but they did not listen to the voice of Yahweh. You can have all the marks of the people of God, but lack the response of the people of God. You can receive the sacrament, but have no faith. You can experience the exodus, eat the manna, Drink the water from the rock and remain in unbelief. You may hold membership about, among God's flock, but have no relationship with the shepherd. They did not obey the voice of the Lord. It's easy to hear, 
but it's another thing to listen and to obey. It makes me wonder what the epitaph will be of this generation here at the Kai Community Church. Remember Jesus said that to all those from, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. To those who have been given much, much will be demanded. When Psalm 95 reflects on this generation, the psalmist says, they put God to the test even though they had seen His work. It urges us today, if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. These words are quoted again in, Hebrew, in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. But I'd like to finish with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 to 12, as Paul rehearses their privileges again. Listen as I read. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from a spiritual rock that accompanied accompanied them and that rock is Christ nevertheless God was not pleased with them with most of them their bodies were scattered over the desert now these things occurred as examples to us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did do not be idolaters as some of them were as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry we should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord, as some of them did. And they were killed by snakes. Do not grumble, as some of them did. They were killed by the destroying angel. See, verse, verse 11 makes the same point. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Paul is saying, God, through Paul, is saying, be very careful. If you think that you are in a safe place spiritually, if you think that you have sin under control, be very, very careful lest you fall. Especially lest you fall in the same way that the wilderness generation did. We saw in Joshua that, that their general crime was that they did not obey the voice of the Lord. Paul lists four specific crimes, which I'll finish with. Verse 7, the crime of idolatry, of claiming to be a follower of God and Jesus, while all the time in reality I give greater allegiance to something or someone else, which can sometimes be a good thing and sometimes not a good thing. Perhaps to my own ambition. Perhaps my desire to accumulate more and more and more. Maybe the desire for a perfect marriage. Making idols of my children and my grandchildren. Paul says that if you are in danger of slipping into idolatry, watch out, take heed. Be very careful lest you fall. Second one, don't indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did and 23,000 fell in one single day. Here's the crime of sexual immorality. In a crowd this size, there might just be someone who is unfaithful to their wife or to their husband. In a crowd like this, there might just be someone sleeping with their partner outside of marriage. Maybe there's someone indulging in a sexual appetite that the Lord absolutely forbids. I'm sure that there will be others who are not actually carrying out those acts, but are very dangerously close to it. God, through Paul, says, you may be from a Christian home and a Bible-teaching church, well-known in Christian circles. You may enjoy the taste of God's Word might even be a leader among the people of God. 
But if you are in danger of slipping into sexual immorality, your privilege counts for very little. little. In fact, it counts for nothing. Be careful that you don't fall. Next comes the crime of testing. The crime of impertinence. Testing God, presuming upon His grace, doubting in His promises. Saying, ach, it's okay, man, I'll do this now tomorrow, I'll just confess my sin. That's testing God. Don't do that. Be careful, lest you fall. Finally, the crime of impatience. The danger of grumbling against God. Angry, always bitter, always resentful. Rather than content. Doubting that He is being good to you even in the face of trials that you face. Be careful, lest you fall. Brothers and sisters, church, maybe this is exactly the warning that we need to hear from God's word. How did you get over this past, get on over the past week? Be careful, lest you fall. So two generations then. The old generation who did not obey the voice of the Lord. A new generation who probably still made many mistakes. That's, that's just the nature of being a follower of God. We're not going to get it right this side of heaven. Perfectly right this side of heaven. So they probably made many mistakes. But they set themselves in the light of God's glorious faithfulness. To obey Him and to serve Him and His agenda in the world. What kind of church will we be? Which generation will we emulate? The summary of the whole book of Joshua. Be faithful. The faithful God who is giving you His promised rest. So listen and obey and serve Him. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit who helps us uh, grapple with this word as we read it and as we um, uh, listen, listen to it being preached and proclaimed. And we pray, Lord God, please will you, will you help us to not just hear. Please, Lord, will you help us to listen carefully and to strive to obey it so that we can indeed strive for godliness and holiness which you demand of us. In Jesus' name, amen.